So uh, quick introductions, right? Yeah, um, Lee Dilworth, VMware, Principal Engineer for Northern Europe. Chad Sakach. I'm the uh, VMware Technology Alliance uh, VP on the EMC side, author of Virtual Geek, more importantly, a nerd who loves VMware. Okay, so today's session is all about uh, understanding stretch clusters, workload mobility, disaster recovery. Mm -hmm. Idea behind it is to hopefully give you an understanding of when to choose one solution, when to choose the other, what are the right questions to ask, what are the right things to think about, how to not be overwhelmed by the Jedi mind tricks of the storage guy. Yep. And Chad's going to be fairly open and honest about that. Um, so hopefully by the end of the session, you'll know what the pros are and the cons are. If you're working on projects, you'll be able to evaluate those yourselves. And the genesis of this, interestingly, a lot of the, you know, Lee's being modest, he's Mr. SRM within VMware. You know, we, we spent a lot of time working with customers. There's a lot of confusion about these topics. So that was the genesis of the session. Okay, so let's get going. So some of this is based on a series of blog, blog articles that Chad still has up on his blog. So I, by all means, go and search those out because a lot of this content is contained there as well for reference. So they'll on virtualgeek.com. So please go and have a look at those. As we said, you know, this is off the basis of a lot of things that we see going on in the field. So let's get started. So the first thing is let's try and do a little level set on the definitions and use some fairly simplistic examples. So don't feel patronized by these in any way. This is just to kind of get us all thinking on the same, same level. So we'll start off with you know, disaster avoidance at the host level. And the purpose of these examples is to illustrate how there's a lot of similarity between logic that applies to a host and logic that applies to a site. So disaster avoidance on a host level, you know, what is all that about? The host's going to go down. You know it's going to go down. You can control that, see it coming. So that is all about V-motion. That's the basic characteristic. We can control that, but there's a massive difference between non-disruptive and almost disruptive when you're talking to vendors. So think about that. Disaster recovery at the host level, what's that about? So this is something we obviously can't control. We can't see that coming. We can't see the power supply failing, the motherboard failing. We can't see somebody kicking the cables out the back when we're not expecting it. But there is obviously something we can do there to protect ourselves. So the host goes down, unplanned event. We can obviously use VMware HA to do a restart of those. But again, by definition, this restart, it's simple, it's automated. So we start to see some similarities with site recovery. What about disaster avoidance now at the site level? So again, we can see certain things coming. We know when we've got scheduled outages for maybe power testing, air con testing. There are certain natural disasters that we can see coming. You know, Irene was you know, obviously you know, a very unfortunate event, but it was something that people could see coming in advance and plan for it and do plan migrations away from it to their DR sites. So when you can see those things coming, you can take some action and V-motion over distance to try and avoid those uh, outages. Obviously, that's non-disruptive. And again, big difference when you're looking at those solutions between that kind of uh, technology and something like SRM. And we'll take a look at that next. So DR at the site level, we can't see these things coming. We can't see earthquakes coming generally. We can't see the electricity company going through our cables to the data center with a big JCB machine. They're unexpected. So we need something that can restart the services for us at an alternate location. So unplanned outages. Again, think about the host example. Same with HA. We can't see the things that HA protects us about coming. It's the same at the site level. The same logic applies. So the restart here is obviously simple. It allows us to test for these outages before they happen. So, you know, SRM can do things like non-disruptive tests. We are not susceptible with these technologies to things like split brain conditions. We're going to talk about that a lot today. And we can obviously control very uh, granularly the sequencing of the startup of the infrastructure services. We can handle different types of network address spaces during those startup sequences as well. So we get a lot more control with the DR workflows. So Chad and I put together a couple of types. I'm going to do a little interesting psychological trick. Did that all seem very simple to everybody? Right? It's really simple, right? And everybody here knows vMotion and vMHA are totally different, right? And they support different use cases, and they're both awesome, right? Right. Right. Interestingly, customers get confused when you apply that to a site for reasons that are very psychological. The type of disaster of an Irene versus the type of a disaster of an earthquake is materially different. And disaster recovery behaviors from, and options and possibilities are very different from an Irene, you'd see it coming, or 
uh, you know, or a meteor crashing into a data center, or being less crazy, someone taking a backhoe and taking out power or circuit, right? It's weird. Customers tend to blur this, and I was just talking literally right before this with a very, very, very mature, sophisticated customer, and they, even after explaining it to them, they said, you know, but couldn't I use something to do both? And the answer is, well, they're different use cases, and we're going to spend the rest of this kind of explaining the technologies behind each one of those things. But people conflate them all the time. Yeah. So let's take a look at um, the types that we've put together to try and illustrate some of this. So type one we've kind of simply called single stretch vSphere cluster. And whenever you're looking at stretch clusters, you know, one thing that's common to all of those designs is a single virtual center instance controlling both of the sites. In this case, we've also got a single cluster inside that virtual center namespace spread across the both sites with storage going that way as well. When you have that, you can obviously do intra-cluster vMotions because it's a single cluster spread across the both sites inside virtual center. So there's some benefits there in that you can do parallel vMotions between the cluster, and we've put some of the limits up there. So obviously that gives you some you know, improvements in terms of performance, moving things around. There are obviously things to think about in terms of uh, limits for things like latency on the network. So up until vSphere 5, the latency limit was 5 milliseconds uh, in terms of the round trip time. With vSphere 5, we're introducing something called Metro vMotion support for Enterprise Plus, which pushes that up to 10 milliseconds round trip time. And just a little you know, quick segue on, you know, on those things. You know, one of the things that you know, I speak to customers about all the time, we, we mentioned this yesterday, is customers get involved in trying to decide which one of these solutions they want very quickly without really thinking, you know, why do they want one or the other? What is it that's driving them to make that decision? You know, are they just going after it from a technology point of view, you know, what is the real business case for doing it? Because you know, if you look at spending a lot of money on network infrastructure to make this happen, you know, what are you trying to achieve? Is it just active, active data center? Is it data center load balancing? Do you think you can really do that? You know, because the amount of money you might need to spend to beef up your network to cope with this, maybe it would have been simpler to just buy extra capacity at both sites, run production workloads, and then put a DR solution underneath. So you, you, sometimes it's really worth taking that step back to think, where are we trying to go with this solution? Litmus test with this customer that I was talking to. We were talking about this, the last ones, layer two equivalents for VM kernel and, and uh, virtual machine networks. And I asked them, you know, are you able to stretch your VLANs between sites? No, we're thinking about using OTV. Do you have somebody on your staff who has been fully trained and is an expert on how to use those NX OS commands on the Nexus 7000 that you're going to need to make that work? And what happens if that person is involved in the disaster? Yeah. You know, you got to think about that, right? Because, you know, that, that adds that degree of, of consideration in the design. Yeah. So when you think about you know, the networking side of it, just think about the vMotion example that we showed right at the start. You know, what does vMotion need to do with a virtual machine? The port group name has to be identical. You know, I didn't say the VLAN has to be identical. I said the port group name has to be identical. So that's where the term... You know, equivalency comes from for the VM network traffic. Yes, it's nice if you can stretch the layer two broadcast domain across the sites. It's not an absolute requirement. There are other ways to do that you know, with, the, with the equivalency term. So as long as the, the destination broadcast domain has the same characteristic and looks and feels the same, you know, it's got the same IP address space, net mass default gateway, and the port group name's the same on the other side, that will work. That's an absolute requirement for the virtual machine traffic. It's amazing the number of people who think or get surprised when the VM moves to the other site and then suddenly can't ping on the network and they wonder why that is. The VM kernel one's interesting because you know, we can route vMotion traffic, but there's a difference between being able to can do something and being able to support something. So you'll see lots of blog articles out there talking about the fact that this happens and you can do it and you've got VM kernel routing table, but the reality is there isn't a VMware support statement today to say that that's been QA'd and tested by us, even though you know, between these four walls it will work. You know, so there's an inherent risk there from a support point of view. The second example is kind of you know, a slight change on that. Basic same design, single virtual center, but now we've created two separate clusters. So this fits more in the storage models where you have a distributed storage capability that you can write to from both ends. So things like EMC vPlex would fit into this space. Considerations. There's a consideration now for vMotion because now you've got two cluster objects in vCenter. That no longer means you're able to do parallel vMotions because now you're Basic as it says there, intercluster. And intercluster vMotions are serialized, not parallelized. Networking considerations, as we put at the bottom there, exactly the same. Same considerations for round trip time, same considerations for layer two. 
So no difference there. The only difference between these two examples is potentially the kind of storage model you're using underneath and the effect on the vMotion. The serialization thing, just to give you a little idea of what we're talking about, um, when we did testing on this where we were trying to do uh, 500 simultaneous vMotions uh, where they're intercluster, the, if you created tiny little micro VMs with no memory state change going on, very, very small configurations, it would still take roughly around five seconds for a vMotion to occur, um, you know, which doesn't sound like a lot, right? But if you were doing 500 of them, you know, that's uh, 500 times five is 2,500 seconds, which translates to many minutes, which is actually longer than, in some case, the startup sequence of, of if an SRM failover. When you're doing an intra-cluster vMotion, they're much faster because there's no vCenter API updates and, and uh, you know, it's part, part of that process. So it's an important yeah. distinction. Yeah. Another thing that we kind of mentioned on this slide as well is, is the consideration about settings. Uh, we're going to talk about this at various points. You know, when you do inter-cluster, the VM will lose its cluster settings as it moves around. And when we get to talking about, you know, metro cluster designs, campus cluster designs, there are things you can do to try and create a sense of awareness in the infrastructure by putting things like host affinity groups and DRS affinity groups in there. But if those settings aren't maintained dynamically, you know, one of the things you have to be able to sign up to is to agree that you're going to manage those settings on a daily basis as part of your ongoing production uh, infrastructure. So, you know, again, these are the things that we're going to talk about as we go through today. So our last example in terms of infrastructure is kind of the classic SRM case. So this is where we've now got two virtual centers, one at each site, managing the infrastructure in each site. And again, each site could be running production workloads, and we could be protecting in both directions with array-based replication, as an example, or even vSphere replication with SRM5. So differences here. Two vCenters means we've got no single point of failure on the management infrastructure. You know, the reason we have two vCenters with SRM is so that if you've told the CIO that you can have a certain RTO and RPO figure and you've tested it to death with SRM, then you're never going to be in a situation where when you have to fail over to the other site, you've lost the single virtual center because that's the one that's died because that's at the other site, but you've already got one up and running at the secondary site and that's ready to go to run those workflows. And that's hugely different to the stretch cluster scenario where you've got a single virtual center server. And the reason we never built SRM to work with one virtual center instance is for that exact reason. We don't want the guy who's on shift at 2 o'clock in the morning spending five or six hours playing around with an Oracle database to try and get Virtual Center up and running so that he can log into SRM and run the recovery plans. Because then he has to explain why the RTO took 12 hours and didn't take the one hour that he promised. That's why SRM always uses two virtual centers. So then you get into the, you find someone who's almost too, too smart for their own britches. I'm mixing a metaphor there, right? They go, well, I could, you know, in the other examples of the stretch case with one, I can use VMHA response and I'll virtualize the vCenter instance and I'll use that to restart on the other side and I could automate it, right? Well, in certain cluster failure scenarios, VMHA response won't work. And then you're searching around using the VI client to connect to all of your ESX hosts to try and find out where you're, you know, and, and boot up, your, boot up your, your vCenter instance, right? Again, there's a de degree of... Uh, uh, Enter at your own risk. You have to be very aware about these operational considerations, right? Again, can you do it? Yes. But what happens if, again, you're the smartest person in the room, but you were part of the disaster? You're, you're, you know, you're putting sandbags around your house because it's being flooded. Yeah. So a quick summary, part one. What have, we, what have we kind of talked about and learned so far? So disaster avoidance and the solutions that make it happen aren't the same as DR. The simple examples we used at the start, I hope, try to clarify that, you know, with vMotion, the HA, and the site examples. Use the same logic when you're trying to, you know, relate that back to, you know, the people in your own organizations. You know, server logic, site logic, very similar, and you can apply the same thought process. Stretch clusters, as we've seen, have many moving parts, many complex considerations. Uh, I think Chad used a brilliant example yesterday, which he says, you know, this isn't a session to say, buy SRM, buy SRM, buy SRM. That's not the purpose of the session. The session is to kind of highlight the fact that if there's 500 of you in this room today, there might be 10% of you where stretch clusters are a perfect fit for what you want to do, and you have the skills and the capability to manage it on a daily basis, and you're willing to sign up to that. But then for the other 90% of you, the other use case might be more applicable, might be simpler, might make the ops team's lives a lot easier. So you can kind of think of it in those terms. And those percentages are actually based on reality. There's more than 5,000 SRM customers out there. I'm happy to say the majority of them using EMC replication technologies underneath the covers. 
but uh, there's hundreds, low, many, t like many tens to very, very low hundreds of happy functioning stretch cluster configurations globally. Again, they both have use cases, so we're not saying go one way or the other. As we go through this, you'll start to discover for yourself, I think, which one is a fit for you. Yeah. And the other thing to say there, finally, is that, you know, as we say, right now, non-disruptive workloads and workload mobility in terms of you know, stretch clustering and use cases like DR are mutually exclusive. But hopefully, as we go through today, you'll see where you know, the roadmap is to try and start to merge those solutions going forward. OK, so I think Chad's going to take it from part two. You bet. Thanks so much, Lee. So uh, let's get into the gory, gory considerations. So um, you know, it starts by understanding these core differences. So in a disaster, workflow matters. In a disaster, being able to start an application uh, after the database is up, running, and functional matters. Again, VMHA in vSphere 5 has got a lot of enhancements about sequencing of starts and operations. But there's very few dependency mappings. And again, this is something where often I find people in a proof of concept, you know, or in a lab, you know, going, hey, I did this test, it worked great. These five VMs restarted. Fantastic. In practice, they've got hundreds of VMs that have got dependencies. And very often they end up needing to recreate SRM like things through complex scripting, you know, on their own, but then, you know, can't sign up for the operational impact of maintaining those scripts. Um, the other thing that we talked about is you must think about the single vCenter problem. What are you going to do uh, to, to solve that, to protect it? Uh, you could use vCenter Heartbeat, right? Uh, but then you need to think about vCenter Heartbeat uh, adds its own constraints about, you know, how big can the VC be, you know, and so, so on and so forth, right? So that needs to become part of the design planning process. Or you can say make it a VM, but then you've got to think about what am I going to do in terms of disaster if it doesn't do a restart? You've got to think about the network stuff. And then cluster split brain. And this is my biggest, I'll, I'll, I'll say, storage vendor annoyance. And since I work for, you know, an infrastructure vendor that happens to sell storage, I'll use my own sales teams as an example. But this is true, by the way, of almost all storage sales teams I've ever seen. They go, we have solved split brain. And the answer is, they have at the storage layer. Split brain occurs at the storage layer and at the VMware layer. The split brain behavior is, if you imagine that, you know, he's on one half of the brain, I'm the other half of the brain, we've gotten disconnected but are both still alive. It's a disaster type where we're disconnected. He's got VMs running on him, I've got VMs running on me, I can't see him, should I start those VMs? Should he start those VMs? What, how do we know, right? And uh, believe it or not, this is an incredibly complex problem. People always, when they're doing those POCs, what the vendors tend to do is they come in and they go, look, I just cut the circuit. Well, that's one failure scenario. Another failure scenario is the network's up, but the storage isn't. Another one is the storage is up, but the network isn't, right? One of them is all the ESX hosts are dead for whatever reason, but the storage is alive and connected via the network. Literally, as we've established you know, more of a formal testing process for these use cases, there's 30 or 40 different partition behaviors, right? So again, what you see in a demo, or what, if it works once, doesn't mean it's going to cover all those dis disaster scenarios. Does that kind of make sense? Um, OK, and the other thing is, is that typically, what I often see the storage vendors doing, and you know, Lee and I gripe about this together, yeah is they go, you can save money by not buying SRM and just using VMHA. Has anyone in the room ever heard that? <laughs> anyone? Anyone? No? Not these, these guys up in the front. I've heard it. Uh, I've heard it from customers. I, sometimes the customers come to that conclusion on their own. The thing is, you need to think about the whole thing. Networking extra elements. What are you going to do to solve that? The storage elements. What is the extra cost associated with the storage elements? The cost of having someone who's going to be your script maintainer, right? You know, all of that stuff uh, needs to figure in there and typically doesn't in the, in the process. I mean, you've seen it, dude. Yeah, absolutely. And, the, you know, the thing that you've got to think about is, you know, and the split brain, you know, issue is, is the big one is, you know, what happens if the system you put in place can't tell you, you know, which side's supposed to be authoritative? What happens if you then get divergence between the two sides? And, you know, most people will find if they're ever unfortunate to be in that situation, when you get the applications that diverge to get them to merge back together, usually incurs an outage that's X magnitudes times longer than they ever would have expected to have in a normal DR scenario. So it's the absolute worst case scenario to get split brain and divergence between 
you know, groups of applications. So um, there's a couple of different ways of doing this. So the first way of the storage model is to literally just stretch the sand or land fabric if you're using NAS between sites. That's not a good idea because the storage array itself is still sitting on one side. So you're kind of rolling the dice 50-50 that that doesn't happen to be the one that dies, right? Um, but then there are methods where you can take a clustered storage model and cut it in half and distribute it between two sites. Uh, this usually depends on synchronous replication. Um, you know, it's limited. Synchronous replication means that you're within roughly around five millisecond round trip latencies because every I.O. will incur that latency impact, right, and gets added onto the normal latency that you'd see within the system. That may not sound like a lot, five milliseconds, but for storage, every few milliseconds matters. Um, it's usually read-write on one side and read-only on the other side, which means that if your VMs ever go on the far side, every I.O. is going to need to always go over the network. And um, the other thing you need to think about is the, if, you, if you split a cluster and therefore only have one brain on either side, your uh, availability profile on one side or the other is now the availability profile of a non-clustered type system. So just a consideration. Um, there's a lot of answers to these problems, and this is kind of what it looks like. Again, we're trying to make this, even though I'm, I'm with EMC, I'm trying to make this as a vendor neutrally discussion. So I'm going to highlight this as, an, as one example. Um, so uh, do we have any NetApp customers in the room? So this is like a NetApp metro cluster as an example, right? So a metro cluster, you cut the cluster in half, you have one brain on each side, and then you use a sync mirror underneath the cover to replicate the aggregate, right, between the things. And if there's a partition, there's mechanisms where you do like the equivalent of a failover behavior, um, so which switches the read-write state from one side to the other. Uh, again, the failure modes you need to think about are both the network and the storage. You need to build a very, very resilient network model between the sites. The other type of configuration that uh, exists in these use cases are distributed virtual configurations. Uh, these typically have read-write on both sides. Um, they also depend on synchronous mirroring approaches, uh, which, again, is the distance limiter. Um, and usually they have multiple controllers in a scale-out kind of way. They, these ones have to deal with a much more complex set of split-brain circumstances than the other example. Um, they kind of tend to look like this. They're typically a little simpler in terms of how the network connects to one another um, and have multiple brains on either side. So examples in this kind of category um, that I can think of would be HP's P4000, so the left-hand based stuff, um, and, uh, and EMC VPlex falls in this category as well. Does that make sense? Again, you've got to think about HA behaviors of losing nodes, losing clusters, losing sides, and then also cluster failures. So using VPlex a little bit more as an example, um, it, it uses a scale-out model and a scale-out architecture. It's always HA, so it all, the, at a minimum has two brains on one side and two brains on the other side, so it can withstand single failures without it being a cluster failure. Um, and you can use it with EMC and non-EMC arrays, so you can virtualize third-party arrays behind it. Now, the thing that is worth this is what the UI looks like. And by the way, if you want to try it, you can go to the hands-on labs and give it a whirl. Um, but what I want to explain is, like, this is, for example, how VPlex deals with split brain at the storage layer. And again, I'm using this as an instructive example. Regardless of what vendor you use, you should ask and understand this behavior because it's important in the partition use cases. So in the VPlex use case, every volume is defined as having a bias towards one side or the other, right? So what that means is that on partition, the problem is you may not know which side is the winner or the loser, and therefore you have to set it up in advance so that you go, if you lose contact with the other side, you either go alive or you go dead immediately because you want to avoid split brain, right? Um, the way that this works is uh, when you uh, get a, a failure of the links between the, the, the cluster, the I.O. gets halted. In fact, in vSphere 5, there's an improved change to how path and uh, device behavior is done. There's been changes to the all paths dead code. There's also some changes that are, are all paths uh, dead. All paths dead. Um, there's actually a nicer word that they're, they're trying to say, not dead, because dead is kind of scary. But yeah. So we've now got permanent device loss. <laughs> yeah, but APD has a different... They're trying to change the acronym. Yeah. <laughs> but in any case, uh, the PDL, permanent device loss, 
it means that the device is, is, is gone. I can still talk to the target, but the, the device isn't there. And it actually has a slightly better failure mode. Um, so the thing that I want to note on that just before we move on, note that the VMs have no idea whether they're on a data store that has a preference for being in New York or in New Jersey, right? So y you know what I mean? So they don't know whether they're on a winning side or a losing side, which means you need to be very smart and put two and two together as the administrator about what side is the preferred site and the bias. We'll talk more about what we're doing down that in, yeah. the, in the future. Um, it's pretty simple and easy to configure. You just go in on the device and say which one of them is the winner. Um, now, this is an interesting thing. Has ever, anyone ever had a scenario where they lose the storage underneath their vSphere cluster? Completely? It's a really bad day, right? Um, has anyone just tried yanking the storage from their, their home labs just for fun? Yeah, all right, we got some brave souls. If you want to save yourself the trouble, I did it, and I posted the results on YouTube. What do you think happens? People tend to think that the VMs immediately blue screen. They do not. They go into this weird zombie state where, believe it or not, they periodically go through waves of like responding to pings, even some TCP sessions stay up, some services start to respond, and then all of a sudden they stop, and then they start again. And think about what that means for split brain behavior, right? You can't guarantee that the VMs will all hard shut down um, on one side unless you set that up manually through a whole bunch of VMHA property setting, right? Which means that it's very possible for VMs to restart on that side while still being a zombie on this side. Just to, just to answer that, you know, whilst it may sound like we're, we're hitting hard on, on stretch clusters and highlighting a lot of problems, but just to you know, highlight a problem that that also would cause SRM. You know, so in an SRM environment, if you yank the storage or lose the storage on the primary site and you go to invoke your failover workflow, you know, one of the things that you're going to see is that, as Chad says, you know, we've got essentially a zombie infrastructure at the primary site. So you've got all these VMs floating around. And what else do you run on that storage at the primary site? You're running virtual center you're running the SRM virtual machine. So they, too, are floating around, not realizing that somebody's cut their legs off. So the first thing SRM is going to do in a failover scenario, it's going to issue step one of the recovery plan, which is shut down the protected virtual machines that I'm about to recover here. So it says, oh, I can still see Virtual Center over there. I'm going to go and talk to him. Uh, can you go and shut down all these 50 They're VMs like, for me? Oh, I can't go. I'm yeah. a zombie. And SRM over here is going to sit here going, he's taking a long time, and I'm going to sit here for a very, very long time before I carry on and get this recovery going. Because SRM is not aware in version 1 and 4 what's gone on over there. It doesn't know that that storage has disappeared, and that's the reason. That virtual center server is essentially now lying to me, saying it's issued commands that are never going to come back. Because the virtual machines can't power down, they're just floating around in CPU memory. So there's a correct way out of that, a correct workaround. The workaround is as soon as the team realize that the outage they're incurring is storage, and it's all gone, they should immediately shut down the ESX host at that site. Get rid of those zombie state VMs. They're no use to you anyway. You're never going to do anything with them ever again. The host needs to go down. That instantly wipes them out. SRM over here, and I go, oh, okay, he's now dead completely. I'll get on and do the recovery. So you know, just to reduce the balance in terms of, you know, there are cons for you know, stretch clusters, and there are cons for SRM, and you just got to understand how to get out of those situations. Okay, so consideration number one. So without these read-write storage models on both sides, it means that your VMs are going to incur some sort of performance penalty on storage I.O. as they go across the network, right? That needs to be in your thinking. Um, again, every millisecond counts. Like we're looking at the hands-on labs. You know, currently they're hovering around like five milliseconds. People in the lab start to complain when the storage latency starts to get to around 15, right? So good, five, 15, bad. If you have five milliseconds round trip latency always, you just have shortened your little, you know, your exposure window has shrunk a lot. Um, when, when you have distributed uh, virtual storage models, this, this isn't a problem in the sense that they're both writable on each side, but they have their own uh, considerations. Uh, so then the interesting thing is, can you configure VMHA and DRS for sidedness in vSphere 4.1? Well, you can configure host affinity groups but that's not supported in vSphere 4.1, right? And there's no sidedness in VMHA, uh, in VMHA's behavior about should I restart on this side or that side? 
In other words, you can get scenarios where you've had a partial failure on one side, a partial disaster, and VMHA will continue to try to restart on hosts which are themselves still unable to restart because they've lost their legs, to use your metaphor, right? Um, so, uh, you know, just important things to consider. Um, with vSphere 5, uh, host affinity rules will start to be supported in um, these geographically dispersed clustered use cases. So that's important. Um, it doesn't address, uh, you know, some of the stuff that was in vSphere 4, you know, and we'll talk about the changes of what's new in, in VMHA behavior. VMHA behavior is much, much better now and how it's architected, we'll talk about that for this use case, but it still doesn't have the idea of sightedness for start. Unless, again, you're willing to be extremely explicit about pre-programming, which is a bad idea in general, about which host will be used for VMHA restart for every single VM you ever create and are willing to maintain that forever. It sounds it, bad another thing to say here is you know, really keep emphasizing that if you're going to put these settings in place, I mean, when you're weighing up the pros and cons of both solutions, if you think that the stretch cluster is the right solution, you have to remember that these settings have to be applied per VM manually. It's not dynamic, so you have to be willing to look at your operational model, who runs the systems day to day, are they going to remember to put the right settings in when you're trying to create this sense of site awareness using host affinity groups? And are you prepared to do that on a daily basis as you're producing new VMs in the system? If you are, great, sign up for it. If you think it'll be a problem and the best practice that the ops guys hold their hands up and say, yeah, we'll do this every day for you, no problem. If you think that will be disappearing after about 20 seconds as soon as you leave the room, then you might want to think about you know, the other solution. So you know, just bear in mind that these settings aren't dynamic. You have to sign up to apply them. Out of curiosity, any VPlex customer in the room? Yeah. Any uh, people using stretched left-hand configurations? So, so anyone using a metro cluster? So you, uh, by the way, anyone here using SRM? So look at the ratios, right? You, you know, kind of like the right model. And, and the other thing is, uh, you know, there are very real use cases to use these stretch clusters. So again, Absolutely. We, we'll, get to, we'll get to some of them. We're just trying to be very explicit about the things you need to think about as you design. So the next one, uh, there's no way to control primary, secondary selection when you're using vSphere 4.x. Uh, there's, you know, the internal constructs that are associated with the way that, uh, you know, that VMHA was designed originally has this idea of how many, what's the maximum number of primary nodes in a cluster? Five. Which ones are they? It, it's actually a relatively complex answer, right? It's the first, it's first five, but they can actually change over time and... And, you know, there, it's, it's very difficult to do it structurally, which results in all cluster configurations when using vSphere 4.1 having a maximum cluster size of eight nodes because that's the only way to ensure that you'll always have a primary on one of the two surviving sides, um, which is frustrating for a lot of folks. Um, there are methods for a specifying the number of, you know, the number of uh, primary nodes. There's ways of specifying which nodes are primary nodes. Those are all not supported by VMware. And again, people get like, oh, not supported. I'm smart. I test. I know how it works. I want to know the advanced properties. I'll give you an example. The advanced property worked. The problem is that when you went from vSphere 4 to vSphere 5, they no longer exist because the idea of a primary doesn't exist anymore. And therefore, if you built an operational process around this, you're kind of borked in the upgrade process, right? So don't do unsupported stuff in, uh, in, in any material way, right? Um, again, some great recommended reading from Duncan Epping on, on this topic. Uh, just ignore his notes about the non-supported <laughs> stuff. <laughs> um, so next one, uh, consideration number five, this layer two equivalence uh, thing. This complicates the network infrastructure. We talked about this, so I'm not going to rehash it. Obviously, the whole VXLAN thing is an interesting idea about potential futures, about potentially simplifying these models. Um, and, and the key thing that's important is, is that if you use vMotion without having these stretched models and the storage is just at one side, the VMs are going to be over here, the storage is going to be over here, you're always going to incur latency penalties, so, you know, it's something to, to consider, right? Um, number six, the network has a lack of site awareness. 
and therefore you will get trombone routing and funky routing scenarios as the VMs go from one side to another. Again, my, my comment to this customer was, if you have a network team in-house that goes, no problem, we can deal with the trombone routing that's going to occur, you are safe to proceed. If they go, trombone routing what? You probably shouldn't proceed, right? Just as a, like a little litmus test. Um, so there's lots of interesting things, you know, that and emerging technologies around the space, list being one of, as an example, um, you know, and, and you're going to need to configure multiple, you're going to have to have more complex isolation address model in traditionally in vSphere 4.1 to kind of harden it in this uh, scenario. So if you summarize this stuff, um, there are these three types. Stretched one, stretched cluster, um, you know, with a single intra-cluster vMotion. You, what do you get? You get vMotion between sites for disasters or that, that are, plan, you know, disaster avoidance. You can see the hurricane coming, right? You know the power outage is coming. Uh, for disaster recovery, in the proof of concept, you'll use vMHA and it will work. In production, you'll probably end up doing some complex scripting thing you're going to need to build and create for all the reasons that we've discussed, right? Um, the pros, it's killer in a demo uh, because it looks awesome. You can vMotion workloads from, you know, New York to New Jersey to, you know, wherever, um, which is really awesome. And by the way, uh, you know, there's lots of customers who really need this. So we had a customer who was a hospital, and they had, uh, you know, a metropolitan network, and literally they needed to to uh, move everything from one hospital to another, and they avoided 50 hours of, of total downtime through the entire process because it wasn't just VMware stuff, it was other stuff too that they needed to move from one place to the other. Um, and for them, that was huge and material, right? But again, for other people, you know, it's okay to, to, to have 15, 20 minutes of downtime as you go from one place to another. Um, it has VM-level granularity, which is nice. You can move a VM, you can... Um, as opposed to, you know, SRM's model, if you're using an array-based, you know, data store replication model, the unit of replication is the data store. And again, the cons, fun funky uh, uh, cluster and VMHA restrictions, it tends to be more operationally complex. Second one, if you had to summarize it, is that you have these two separate clusters, right? Uh, you're going to do vMotion between sites. Uh, you're, for DR, you're going to have to do scripting because you can't use VMHA because it's... The domain of VMHA is a cluster. The domain of vMotion is the vCenter uh, namespace. Um, the pros, you can cover disaster avoidance and disaster recovery. In broad use cases, there's no VMHA restrictions. The downside is that there's no escaping the fact that you must embrace complex scripting and operations and all that sort of stuff. And then the last one is the classic SRM uh, scenarios. The disaster avoidance, it's always disruptive. In other words, there will always be some period of downtime. Now, in vSphere 5, which we'll talk about, there's lots of stuff that makes it simpler and easier for workload mobility uh, workflows, um, but, and you can, you can make that simple and easy. Uh, for disaster recovery, you run the recovery plan, right? And uh, in my experience, if you add up all of the bazillion different failure scenarios, the, all the different disasters, and, which is a real statistical analysis, Typically, this solution has the best RPO, RTO, recovery point objective, recovery time objective. How long does it take to recover? And, you know, how much data loss do you have when you recover? In the broadest set of failure scenarios. Um, so, <coughs> it's also very simple and very robust. Not perfect. We gave one example, we'll give others. But uh, uh, typically simpler than the other two, operationally. So, in general, the one at the bottom tends to be the one that's the right fit for most uh, folks. Um, the little last thing I wanted to put in here is, again, don't let storage vendors do the Jedi mind trick on you, right? These are not the droids you're looking for. Um, the, I'm paraphrasing here. In the immortal words of Yoda, which I will not try and imitate, uh, like all of you, I'm sure you're losing your voice, and I'm losing mine. Think not of the sexy demo. Think of operations. Think of operations during the disaster. You're on your vacation in Jamaica. Do you want to say, hit the recovery plan? <laughs> or do you want to go, oh my goodness, I've got to fly up, right? Um, so, what's new? Yeah, okay, let's take a look. 
So, what's the in SRM5? Please for your head chair. We're going to skip through these uh, fairly quickly in the interest of time, so I'll get going. So, SRM5, what have we put in there? So, we've put some, I'm not going to go through all of these bullets, but what's the important things that apply to these use case, cases? First one, I guess, is to highlight plan migration. So, again, you know, think about what you're trying to solve when you're looking at uh, stretch clusters versus a DR solution. We've already said for the majority of people, the kind of the DR case probably fits for some pe the minority of people who've got the skills and the operational overhead to handle it, you know, the stretch cluster is fine. But most people start down that route for an active, active data center design, wanting to use both sites. But again, when you've, everything you've seen here, if you think the investment might be cheaper to just put capacity in each site, you can put the DR, DR design in. You still can do application migration with SRM. You still can use the planned uh, migration workflow that we've got in SRM 5. Gives you zero data loss, application consistent movement between sites. Schedule an outage, it'll shut the virtual machines down, it'll do a storage push now with the extra API calls we've got in SRM5 if you're using asynchronous, bring the virtual machines up using the recovery plan in the sequence that you've predetermined. So again, that's that disruptive workload mobility. And again, as Chad says, you know, think about yeah, the demos, the, you know, stretch clustering look very sexy, but it's, you know, the old cliche is just because you can doesn't necessarily mean you should. You know, and it's, it's one of those things where you think, how often would that solution help you? You know, the hospital case is an example. That would help them all the time. So they're one of the customers where a stretch cluster is a good fit. You know, so think about that when you're looking at these designs. One thing, uh, just as an interesting question. So if, if you're using SRM, any version of SRM for, uh, you know, for whatever, raise your hand again. Uh, if you're using EMC replication, raise your hand again. Good news. We're in day one support SRAs for all the EMC replication products for SRM 5 are already so yeah. Merry and Christmas <laughs> the other thing in terms of simplicity for operations guys and again we've seen this as a barrier to adoption for SRM in the field is the fail back piece everybody knows that's manual everybody knows it can be done but again like a lot of systems they're designed by one part of the company the engineering team and then they're thrown over the fence to the ops guys ops guys don't like things that involve scripts and lots of steps they like a button to press and then they like it to basically orchestrate and recover in that sequence SRM 5 will now give them that simplicity so that will increase the adoption of SRM amongst operations teams. So that's a good thing. We've improved things like IP customization, speeded up the way that works in SRM 5 as well. So again, helps customers who haven't got the time or the infrastructure or even the budget to alter their network to make it layer 2 stretching or layer 2 equivalent so they don't have to re-IP. So from day one, they have a solution in place where it doesn't matter if the address space is different. SRM can alter that in flight as the VMs are powering on. So we're just going to skip through these in the interest of time. So these for replication is obviously in SRM5 as well. I'm not going to go into this in a lot of detail other than to say you get it whether you want it or not in SRM5. It's part of all licensed packages. It allows you to do per virtual machine replication across any storage that vSphere supports. So anything ISO E5 channel data stores, anything to anything. So again, allows you to cast your net out to all of your virtual machine workloads for DR protection. One thing that's interesting on this, just a very, very quick note, I've seen many customers very interested in using both. They use array-based replication for scale, for consistency groups, for automated failback, for the big things, and then, and then they're like, well, I just need these little ones protected. I'm going to use vSphere, uh, you know, replication 1.0 for that. These are uh, HA. We've completely rewritten it from the ground up. It's still called HA, but it's a brand new piece of the architecture. We've got rid of the primary secondary concept. We have master slave now gets rid of all of the barriers in terms of how many primaries you've got on one side, and as Chad talked about, in terms of the cluster sizing. We have extra communications paths for working out where the isolations occurred, so we can use not only the network isolation paths, but we can also use uh, data stores as well. So when we look at the data stores, we've got heartbeat um, metadata inside the VMS volumes or the NFS exports. That helps when we have partition situations occurring. It helps the master decide who owns the VMs and how they restart. And these are things that we're adding in and developing along our roadmap to also start to help make the stretch use to cl uh, cluster use cases simpler. So you can see we are attacking both of the use cases and making them both simpler, the DR use case and the stretch cluster. So you know, I hope that reinforces that we're not trying to tell everybody in the room today, just use the DR use case. You know, there's engineering work going on in both areas to make it easy for you to deploy. Literally this one feature in the updated VPlex VMHA stretch cluster KB article makes it, instead of being a document, if you printed it from like here to the ground, into something that's like this long, just because the partition use cases are so much simpler. Previously, if there was a partition, there was no way to know what was going on on the other side. The fact that the metadata file will be there no matter what in a, in a state on the other side 
means that you can say, yeah, definitively, this is my, I'm the owner, and I need to take ownership, and I want to move forward. Yeah. Metro VMotion, I've talked about already. We're doing a lot of work in this space around improving the site awareness of the management side of things. You know, so it's all very well and good being able to VMotion things across. But if you think about, simple example, right back to the start, VMotion. Think about all of the pre-flight checks VMotion does before it moves a VM. You want, if you're going to give a non-disruptive you know, workload mobile platform to people, and certainly the ops guys, you would expect us to do all of those checks before you move workloads between sites hot. Because you know, what are the risks if you don't do that? You know, if, we just take, if we let the ops guys just take a work stream and move it from one site to the other without checking things like, what's the impact going to be on CPU, network, IOPS? Are we going to violate any security policies? Are we going to violate the backup rules? All of those things we're trying to build in to the versions of vSphere going forward, vSphere 5, to try and make that more usable in an operational sense. So again, these are also other considerations when you're looking at stretch cluster. I'm going to do this super fast. So vplex 5.0 is out. Uh, vplex 5.0 uh, expands the support for more third-party arrays, thin use cases, supports a Lua configurations for uh, you know, more classic active passive style uh, two brain arrays. Um, there's a witness, which I'll describe. You can create extremely robust hardened uh, cluster configs where they're not only using the simple cluster interconnect, but in essence they're all kind of matrix to one another, which means it's much more difficult to have failures. And then we also introduced VPlex Geo, which is the ability to have VPlex use cases across asynchronous use cases. Can you use it with VMware? I'll talk about that in a second. So there was also new hardware. While we always throw up the diagrams like the full-blown cabinet, if you want the big Cylon light on the front, hey, that's cool. But sometimes people want to just put in their third-party racks. That's cool, too. One of the nodes looks like that. That's the front and the back of a VPlex node. And it's basically got, it's an HA two-brained pair, and they grow in a cluster um, where you can have a total of basically eight um, on either side for scaling up the performance. Um, this is the example I was mentioning. Customer, very happy. VPlex Witness. It's a virtual appliance that basically acts as a third-party witness in the decision-making process of is there, is there a disconnection between the sites. It hardens some of the scenarios. It actually speeds up failure, which is a desirable trait um, in some of these use cases. And it's simple and it's integrated um, and uh, helps a lot in some of these scenarios. Now, the use cases for this idea of vPlex, because remember, it's a funky idea. You can actually access the information simultaneously in two different places. The first one is this mobility scenario that we're talking about. The other one sometimes is mobility. Sometimes a customer considers an array itself a single point of failure. Right? And they're not looking for disaster recovery between data centers. They're saying, literally, I want to make sure that the array itself isn't a single point of failure, even though the arrays are all designed to be extremely redundant, and certainly we think ours are. Right? So sometimes what customers do is they use a vPlex cluster to make a, a more robust, in essence, little local solution. And then there's this collaboration thing that doesn't have anything to do with this use case, but it's a funky one. Sometimes like when people are collaborating on editing video files and stuff like that, one team is in you know, Australia and one team is in New York, and they can actually edit the same sort of content at the same time uh, using a vPlex Geo config. Now, the question is, with VMware, these are these you know, local metro geo. Local, good. Metro, good. Geo, not good today. The reason it's not good, it's very uh, confusing. I'm going to try and do a blog post on it uh, later on. But in, it, in essence, in a vPlex Geo configuration, unlike the metro configuration, the data isn't synchronous, which means that the data doesn't actually exist simultaneously in both sides. If you looked at the data stores from the ESX host view, it would look the same on both sides, but what happens is if it tries to access some information which isn't local, it sucks it over from the other side, right? On a partition, that means that for a given data store, some of the VMs would be good and some of the VMs wouldn't. And you'd have to revert back the whole data store 15 minutes ago to kind of bring it back into a coherent state which means that a partition means that you have data loss for some VMs that were healthy. Does that make sense? And it's for that reason, even though it works in the lab and you can make it do all sorts of funky stuff and get demos of it going, our guidance to the customers is from VMware and from EMC, for now, Metro use cases. There's lots of great documents. In fact, there's one that got published very recently with Brocade, VMware, and EMC around using um, Metro, Metro vMotion. Uh, there's KB articles and things along those lines. But now, I think the more important part, what are we working on? 
So we'll do this just very quickly because there's, you know, in the interest of time, there's a lot of projects and we can only even just mention a, a, you know, a fraction of them here. Um, so you know, things like you know, VM component protection, again, this is targeted at helping the stretch cluster use cases. So make HA aware, you know, more site aware, but also make it more aware of the individual components underneath the virtual machine. You know, things like link failures for storage, link failures for network, make it be able to distinguish what the VM actually needs to survive and figure out which of the hosts left in the cluster are not healthy hosts. So you know, don't try and restart a VM on a host that hasn't got the IP storage link for that particular data store. And if you see hosts that are like that, quarantine them in the cluster you know, so that you're left with only the healthy host. So it's one of the things that we're working on. The other thing, automate the stretch cluster configuration. Remember we said you know, one of the things you've got to be willing to sign up to as a team of yourselves is to maintain the cluster, to maintain the settings, to make sure it works the way that you expect it to work and to try and minimize any outages and you know, DR disruption. You know, there's things we can do to help that. What if we can help automate those settings, create more awareness inside things like HA, DRS, storage DRS, to make the whole infrastructure more aware of like New York and you know, New Jersey? I'll give you a really practical example. Has anyone done any of the storage, profile-driven storage labs or gone to a VASA session, right? Anyone? Raise your hands. No? So the VASA providers today tell you kind of storage behavior. We could surface up, I'm, I'm, I'm using this side as the winner. I'm using this side as the winner, right? The problem is that that would need to go up into some sort of policy basis of, and therefore I'm going to only put VMs into a host affinity rule pool, right, for that side or that side. Does that make sense? Now, the other thing I'd highlight, did anyone go to VSP 3205? So I'll leave it, I'll leave it for now then. Uh, just uh, the big picture here is it would be really cool if the storage didn't replicate the LUN instead just replicated the VM, then we could actually do all sorts of funky stuff where you, know, you could use these geo use cases, which is a good segue, you know, I think, to the next one. So topology support. So again, there's lots of things that we're looking at doing. You know, if you take like, the metro use case, you know, customers are you know, coming to us saying, you know, we want to put the metro use case in. I go to customer meetings where you know, the data sensors are literally 20 feet apart and the customer wants to put SRM in. You know, in, and th in those use cases, unless they have a very good reason, I'll push back against that, because to me, that's not DR. They should be really looking at campus cluster, stretch cluster scenarios. That's the ideal use case, or even very short distances. You know, so it's just identifying you know, what, is, what is the requirement. But sometimes they want a C site. They want another site that they can go to asynchronously, and they want us to support that. So, you know, so we're actively working on supporting that in a future release. And then down the bottom right-hand side there, we've got the geo use case. So the customers that want the cake and eat it solution, they want us to merge disaster avoidance and DR together, and we are actively pushing all of the solutions from both vendors towards that. You know, so that will come eventually. We'll get there. The one in the upper left is closer. The one in the bottom right is further. And that's as specific as we're going to get yeah. on dates. <laughs> OK, so I think, I think that's it for the content. We did have some kind of extensive kind of Q&A back and forth we were going to do. But in the interest of time, I think it's probably fairer that we open it up to, to anybody that wants to come up to a mic and ask if, a question. There are two mics there. If you've got a question, come on up and, and ask. We'd love, to, we'd love to hear an answer. And by the way, if, if, uh, what, we, what we thought we'd do is we're going to do a blog post on this topic afterwards. So if you have a question that occurs in your mind, you can have the dialogue on the blog post, and we'll go from there. So first question. Uh, is there any guidance as to, for SRM5, how much or how many VMs or kind of what the maximum amount of storage that vSphere replica replication can handle? Or, in, or is, there a divide, is there some sort of divide line saying I have to go to host base for above X amount of VMs or storage? Um, so in terms of scalability, the, the limit on how many VMs you can protect uh, at the high level is 500 VMs with vSphere replication. Um, there is no limit on storage in terms of, of capacity and footprint. There's obviously considerations around the RPO because vSphere replication is, is asynchronous and it can only be as aggressive as 15 minutes and go up to 24 hours, so you kind of have to factor that in. Um, the other thing in the .0 release, so 5.0, is that vSphere replication cannot take advantage of the automatic failback workflow. That will come in a point release fairly soon, so that's another consideration. Um, so obviously the main use cases for vSphere replication are Remote office, branch office, heterogeneous SAN scenarios where you can't replicate like for like, uh, scenarios where you have SAN replication, but maybe the application's sitting on it now, uh, end of life or approaching sunset, and you just want to move them off the SAN now because they can't cost justify being there anymore. So you can start to push uh, those applications down to the vSphere replicated layer. Some other considerations beyond scale and performance are things like 
Sometimes you have to have consistency across multiple VMs. Uh, vSphere Replicator is consistent across VMDKs within a VM, but if you had multiple VMs that had codependencies, you know, a database, whatever, then you, you know, you go one way versus the other. Um, the other one is, is uh, the fail back, um, you know, yeah. point. And, and then the third one that I typically see is that um, the process of initial seeding um, and reseeding in, in the 1.0 version is typically more, quote unquote, consumptive. Yeah. Of, uh, of uh, networking resources, or you can file copy it if you want, but um, then, then storage models. So just like the Monster VM is allowing you to cast the virtual net out across more workloads in terms of what you can handle, the idea for vSphere replication for array-based customers is now that they can now have a complete DR catalog yeah. and pretty much any workload in the organization they've got an offering for, whether it be on the array, or if the application owner only wants to spend a few cents on his VM per month, they could offer vSphere replication until he's willing to spend a bit more on his application RPO needs to move up to you know, something like a synchronous replication platform on SRDF or MirrorView or whatever that is. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Don't be shy. Please give feedback on the forums. Um, you know, that, that matters if you found the session good. Um, let us know. That's a great way of giving us feedback on, on what we could do better, too. Uh, again, thank you, everyone, for being uh, part of the session, being customers. Thank you.